Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to take a relatively complex topic, that is movements at the subtalar joint, and we're going to hopefully break it down into an easily digestible form for you. Now this is a topic that's easy to get lost in the weeds. We're going to take it one step at a time. We're going to start really with a surface anatomy approach, and then we're going to get into all the details about how all these bones uh, associated with the ankle joint actually move. Now remember, the subtalar joint is a joint that is composed of the talus proximally and the calcaneus distally. Okay? So for example, this is from another video, but if we look at this bone right here, this is the talus. Beneath it, distally, is the calcaneus. And this joint that lies between the talus and the calcaneus is the subtalar joint. Now, when we think of ankle movements before we ever took anatomy and physiology, uh, what we're usually thinking of is dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. These are movements of the talocrural joint. Okay, this is a joint between the talus and actually the tibia and fibula above. Now, unless you've gotten into some heavy-duty weeds here with the ankle, when most people think of the ankle joint, they're really thinking of the talocrural joint, which is the joint between the talus right here distally and actually the tibia and fibula above it, proximally. And so if you actually look down at your foot and you point your toes up toward the sky or point them down towards the ground, you're actually looking at dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And these are movements at the talocrural joint. However, when we think of more inversion and eversion, then we're looking really at movements of the subtalar joint. So if you look at the plantar surface of your foot, the bottom of your foot, and you angle that uh, medially, you're inverting the foot. If you angle that laterally, you're everting the foot. And when I consider the subtalar joint, it's nice to think about eversion and inversion. However, at some point, I need to start thinking about composite movements of the subtalar joint. In order to do that, I need to look at supination and pronation. Okay? So what's the difference between inversion and eversion? and supination pronation. Okay? Inversion and eversion are just one simple movement. Okay? So if you take your plantar surface of the foot and you angle it medially, that is inversion. Okay? If you take the plantar surface of your foot, again the bottom of it, and angle it laterally, that is eversion. Okay? Whereas supination and pronation are composite movements. If we look at supination, we're actually looking at three or more combined movements. Uh, depending on the list that you're looking at, you can look at three or four. Okay, But this is a combination of movements. And actually within supination, we actually have subtalar inversion. Likewise, pronation is also a composite movement. Uh, within pronation, it involves subtalar eversion. But there's some other things involved in there that we're going to get to in just a little bit. So understand that supination and pronation are really composite movements. Subtalar inversion and eversion are simple movements, but each of these is a part of one of these composite movements. Okay? Now, let's define these composite movements with a surface anatomy view. So in each of these pictures, we're actually seeing a left ankle, and we're actually, of course, looking at the posterior view. And before we go any further, we need to define STJN. This is subtalar joint neutral. This is really just the neutral state of the subtalar joint. Okay, what does that mean? Well, again, we're looking at the posterior aspect of a person's left ankle and foot. So what you do to determine if somebody is in subtalar joint neutral is you draw the midline, just draw a line that represents the midline of their calf, and then another line that represents the midline of the calcaneus. And if the person is in subtalar joint neutral, those two lines should be parallel to one another. Just quickly take a glance to either side. Notice these lines on the first picture and the third, those are not parallel to one another. As long as these lines are parallel to one another in this manner, that individual pretty much is in subtalar joint neutral. Okay? Now, for the rest of the video, we're considering a non-pathologic case. Because as you hopefully know, uh, you can be in subtalar joint neutral, but you can also have your subtalar joint pronate, and you can have it supinate, and those within reasonable limits are normal movements. Okay? I need to be really careful with this terminology here. Okay? So with these pictures, they're of course pictures. They're looking at one snapshot in time. 
So this is not supination. This is really just a supinated state. Okay, if you actually see an ankle in this position, you could say it is supinated. Likewise, over here, if you see an ankle joint like this, you would say it's pronated. Okay, now, what is supination and pronation? Well, these are really the actions, right? So if I go from subtalar joint neutral to a pronated state, that process, of course, is pronation, right? But if I go then from the subtalar joint neutral state to a supinated state, well then that process is supination. So really to be rigorously correct here, uh, pronated and supinated are really the states of the ankle, really the subtalar joint. And then pronation and supination, those are the actions. So when you're talking about pronation, for example, you're talking about movement from subtalar joint neutral into a pronated state. Likewise, if you're talking about supination, you're talking about movement from subtalar joint neutral into a supinated state. Okay. Now, there's a couple things to notice here uh, when we're looking at supinated state and pronated state of the ankle. When we're looking at the supinated state, notice that those lines that we drew in earlier, those no longer are parallel to one another. In fact, if you kind of follow them to where they would intersect, you'll notice they actually point out a little laterally. Okay. So if you're actually looking at the posterior aspect of somebody's ankle and you notice that uh, really the ankle seems to be pointed out laterally, then you might be able to say that individual is in a supinated state. If we look at the pronated state, we can still follow these lines right here and notice where they would intersect. It's actually pointing in medially. So if you look at the posterior aspect of somebody's ankle and the ankle appears to be pointing in medially, you might say that is in the pronated state. Now, being able to identify a supinated ankle versus a pronated ankle versus a neutral ankle relative to the subtalar joint, uh, that's useful, but there's other things that actually happen along with that. And really, I also need to be careful uh, with these terms here, pronated versus supinated. Okay. When we're looking at the lateral view of the foot, you can actually see that the size of the arch actually changes depending on whether or not we're in the neutral state pronated state or the supinated state. Now, what you'll notice is if you look at this arch right here in the pronated state, that arch is greatly diminished. Um, we can look at really the medial and lateral lo uh, longitudinal arches of the foot, but really it's mainly the medial arch. Notice that medial arch is collapsed in a pronated state. Okay? We go to subtalar joint neutral, it has a slightly higher arch than we had in the pronated state. And then in the supinated state, uh, this foot's going to have the highest arch of all. Okay? Now, when you're looking at these pictures, okay, zoom in a little bit, these right here are obviously tarsal bones. right? Now, one really important thing to understand about pronated versus supinated states is the state of the tarsals. Okay? Now, again, it's going to be a lot more complicated than this if you really get into the weeds. But the basic idea is when the, when the subtalar joint right here between the talus and the calcaneus, when it's in the pronated state, it has some effects downstream on the other tarsal bones. And generally speaking, when you're in the pronated state, those tarsal bones separate, meaning there's just a little bit more space between those tarsal bones. But what effect might that have on the tarsal bones? Well, they're going to be more mobile relative to each other. If there's more space between them, they're more mobile. In the supinated state, we have the opposite. So when the subtalar joint goes into a supinated state, uh, then that has effect downstream on the other tarsal bones. And generally speaking, those tarsal bones come closer together. They get locked. Well, what effect do you think that might have on their mobility? Well, it's going to drop. It's actually going to become more stable, more rigid. So what does that all mean? Well, if we look at the pronated state, all those tarsal bones have more space in between them, and so they're more mobile, and so the pronated foot is going to be better for shock absorption, okay, for accepting weight. Whereas the supinated foot, where the tarsal bones are closer together, if they're more locked and rigid, this is going to be better really for pushing off. And so one place we might see the supinated foot is in the toe-off or push-off of the gait cycle. So if you look at this point in the gait cycle, this individual, notice he or she, is actually pushing off with their right foot. That subtalar joint is going to be supinated, and also those tarsal bones are going to be closer together, locked, and rigid.
Now, in contrast, if we go back here to loading response, look at this individual's right foot, it's having to accept weight. And into mid stance, you've got weight on that foot. So that foot better be good at shock absorption, especially going from initial contact to loading response, because you're actually accepting your entire body weight, maybe not the entire body weight, but a significant fraction of it. So that foot better be good at shock absorption. And so in this area of the gait cycle, the subtalar joint's gonna be pronated and those tarsal bones are gonna be a little bit further apart, so you have increased mobility. If the bones, that is the tarsal bones, were close together and locked, it would be terrible at shock absorption. Likewise, this pronated foot uh, cannot really generate a lot of power. Now, other states where you might see a pronated foot versus a supinated foot, uh, for example, a pronated foot you might see if you're doing the leg press. Okay? So if you are loading a lot of weight onto your feet through the leg press of the gym, your feet are going to be pronated. In contrast, if you're doing calf raises or heel raises, so working your gastrox, hopefully you know what that machine is, you're obviously going off on both of your toes, your foot's going to be more in a supinated state. Okay? You're going to have to absorb shock somewhere, but again, in the calf raise exercise, you're going to have to be more supinated there. So hopefully this part of the video has given you a good idea about the overall function of pronation and supination. Now that we hopefully understand what it looks like on the surface, and also a lateral view of the individual tarsal bones, we need to understand the overall movements associated with supination and pronation. Now, we can talk about these things in open chain or closed chain. Open chain would be where that foot is not on the ground. Okay, It's in the air, basically. But the most common application of this is when the foot is planted on something. So let me orient you with this, these pictures. Okay. Uh, this is the lateral side, this is the medial side for all three of these. Okay? Um, this right here in purple, this is really just representing the tibia on the right here, and the fibula on the left, of course, is much smaller. Over here would be the lateral malleolus, this would be the medial malleolus. Okay, so purple is tibia and fibula. The blue right here, that's the talus, and red is the calcaneus. Okay? And over here in the middle, this setup is what we have in subtalar joint neutral. Now, if we look at this black line right here, what is this? Okay? This line is not the midline. Okay? It is not the midline of the body. Okay? But it's more or less representing distance from the midline of the body. Okay? This line is in the same spot on each of these pictures, and so it's going to allow us really to see the movement of the tibia and fibula uh, relative to the calcaneus, because actually what we're going to see is that the tibia and fibula are actually going to move either laterally or medially relative to the calcaneus. Okay? So here's your subtalar joint neutral. Okay? Again, we have that midline of the calf right here, if that's where the tibia and fibula are. And again, here's the midline of the calcaneus. And lo and behold, they are in line with each other. So this would be subtalar joint neutral. Okay? Now, a few other anatomy things. Right? This right here is the ankle mortis. Okay? Remember, the ankle mortis is made up of the medial border of the lateral malleolus, the lateral border of the medial malleolus, and then the roof of the ankle mortis is really just the inferior part of the tibia. Okay? All of this makes up the ankle mortis, and the talus sits underneath that, or we could say the ankle mortis sits on top of the talus. And then the calcaneus sits underneath the talus. And this joint right here, between the blue bone, which is talus, and the red bone, which is calcaneus, this is your subtalar joint. Now let's first look at supination, closed chain supination. Now there's several things that happen here in closed chain supination. Number one, uh, notice that we get talar dorsiflexion. Okay? Uh, what does that mean? It actually means that the talus is actually going to dorsiflex relative to the calcaneus. Really all that means is that the anterior part of the talus is actually going to rotate up a little bit and the posterior part of the talus is actually going to rotate down a little bit. Okay? Just like you can have your whole foot dorsiflex, uh, you can also have the talus individually dorsiflex. The other thing that happens is the talus is also going to abduct. It's going to move away from the midline. So this black line right here, the solid line, this is the midline from before. Right over here, this is our midline. Notice that the talus has actually translated a little bit um, away from that midline. Okay? In subtalar joint neutral, the talus is more or less right on the midline. 
But over here in supination, that talus is going to abduct a little bit. So the talus is going to dorsiflex and abduct. The other thing that's going to happen is the calcaneus is going to invert. Remember what inversion was. You look at the plantar surface of the foot and it angles toward the midline in inversion. So notice the calcaneus has actually rotated in such a way that the plantar surface of it is now angled more toward the midline. Here's our medial aspect. Now, remember the ankle mortis sits on top of the talus. So if the talus moves, the ankle mortis moves. And if the ankle's mortis moves, then by association, the tibia and fibula also move. So because, notice the talus moves away from the midline, because we have Taylor abduction, uh, we really also sort of have the distal part of the tibia and fibula also kind of move away from the midline. They actually move laterally. In fact, if you look at this picture right here in, in a supinated state, notice that when we're in a supinated state, we have our ankle joint kind of pointed out laterally. It collapses laterally. Why is that? Because we have calcaneal inversion. Okay. Notice that when the calcaneus inverts, the top surface actually is pointed laterally more or less, so it more collapses laterally. So the ankle right here more or less collapses laterally. And then also the distal part of the tibia is going to move laterally because the talus is moving away from the midline, moving laterally. And so overall you have a varus state. Varus, the way you can think about it, is a force coming from the medial side and pushing out laterally. That's varus. In fact, you can actually see a little bit that the, the calf is actually angled laterally as you go down. Okay, um, and that's because as the talus moves away from the midline, as it abducts, it sort of takes the ankle mortis with it, and the, then the tibia and fibula kind of end up being angled laterally down, and hopefully you can see that. And that's why you have this sort of ankle collapse laterally in a supinated state relative to subtalar joint neutral. The other thing that also happens is that the tibia externally rotates, uh, so just keep that in mind. The tibia also externally rotates on the talus. Now for closed chain pronation, pretty much everything's the opposite. Now we have Taylor plantar flexion. That just means for the talus that uh, the posterior part of the talus actually rotates up and the anterior part of the talus rotates down. Okay, Just like you could have the whole ankle plantar flex that individual talus can plantar flex. Also the talus adducts, it moves toward the midline. Also the calcaneus everts in pronation. Okay, So that means that the plantar surface of the calcaneus is now angled more out laterally. So hopefully that makes sense, calcaneal eversion. And then again, remember, by a similar argument, remember the ankle mortis sits on top of the talus. So if the talus moves medially, then the ankle mortis moves medially, and then by association, the distal part of the tibia also moves medially. And you can see that here, the tibia, at least the distal part, moves medially. And so because you have that along with the calcaneal eversion, in pronation, or pronated state I should say, you actually have collapse of the ankle medially. And so hopefully you're starting to see with these individual movements that make up the entire composite movement, why the ankle looks a certain way when it's supinated versus pronated. Okay. And then the final thing to discuss here, just very briefly, is that when you're in pronation, the tibia actually internally rotates on the talus. Okay. So hopefully this video gave you a good thorough understanding of these composite movements of the subtalar joint, supination, pronation. You can get into a lot more detail with this, and you get into the weeds a little too much, but hopefully you understand a little better now. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.